Right, uh, I think it's time. Uh, let's start. Uh, first of all, I apologize. I wasn't able to be here uh, uh, in the last two lectures by Professor Yang, uh, but I understand that he has talked about uh, uh, how phase and quantization came about. And in the next uh, three lectures, uh, I'm going to treat a topic which really bring the two concepts together. Uh, how by using the concept of phase uh, with the least action principle, one can arrive at quantization. Uh, I also apologize that uh, uh, in the uh, lecture PowerPoint slides and in the homework assignments, uh, there are quite a few uh, mistakes of minor signs and perhaps factors of two, which I hope you will discover. And if you could report all uh, mistakes to uh, uh, UNO, uh, I'll try to uh, correct them uh, next time I teach it, all right? Okay, and uh, there will be no homework assignment for this week, all right? And uh, just to let you know, the final exam uh, will be largely based on variations of the homework. So if you really understand the homework, uh, you probably do, can do uh, uh, the final exam. Okay? All right, so uh, in these three lectures, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the least action principle and related concepts. Uh, but let me start by giving you an overview of these three lectures for these three days. Uh, uh, from the least action principle going towards the path integral and quantum mechanics, all in three lectures. Uh, the idea is the following. Well, we will start with Newton's laws, and today I will tell you, and this is, must be reviewed, this is stuff that you should know, but I will just emphasize some concepts that you may not be too familiar with, uh, how uh, we can go from Newton's laws, F equals MA, uh, to a different formulation of classical mechanics, purely classical today, uh, which is the principle of least action that the correct path is selected by minimizing the action S, uh, where the action is the time integral of the Lagrangian. Then uh, in the next lecture, uh, I will then move towards quantum mechanics uh, by telling you that if a particle moves along a certain path, the quantum phase, uh, which is phi in the second line, uh, uh, the quantum uh, wave function can be written as e to the i phi, uh, where phi along a path is simply the classical action divided by h bar. That is the first step uh, towards quantum mechanics, all right? Uh, the quantum mechanical phase uh, is simply classical action divided by h bar. That will be the second lecture. And also, uh, actually, uh, in quantum mechanics, the particle does not go along a single path. Uh, in a certain way of uh, thinking, the particle samples all possible paths, and actually the quantum wave function is obtained uh, by summing over all possible paths uh, for this function. And this is just a mathematical representation of the sum over all paths, more properly called a path integral. Okay, so I'll tell you about the path integral. And uh, finally, in the third lecture of this uh, uh, series of three, uh, I will give you a derivation how that path integral formula uh, leads to the Schrodinger equation. Okay, so uh, in three lectures we will go in a rather neat and compact way from classical mechanics uh, to your familiar form uh, of quantum mechanics. So that is the plan for lectures three, four, five. Right, so today, lecture three, uh, I will talk about these topics, uh, starting with Newtonian mechanics, the least action principle, uh, I will derive the equation of motion, and also the more general form uh, involving the Euler-Lagrange equations. Uh, I will talk briefly about the advantages of the least action principle, and then I will deal with two examples, uh, both of which you should already have done uh, in your ex uh, uh, homework assignments. One is for the relativistic free particle, the other is for the EM field, particle in an EM field. Uh, the first uh, example is to illustrate uh, the power of the least action principle. The second is to derive uh, the formula for a particle, charge particle in an EM field, uh, which we will need to use, uh, very importantly, uh, in the later parts of this course, in the quantum context. All right? So since you, the first few parts you know already, I will go through rather quickly. All right? uh, the detailed derivation you should already have done uh, in the homework assignments and, in fact, in your previous classes. So Newtonian mechanics, and I will, of course, just illustrate with one particle in one dimension, but the idea is general. So uh, for one particle moving in one dimension, uh, the motion is uh, described by a curve like this, x of t. That is what you want to find, right? Uh, and the path is then uh, uh, a function x of t. And when we want to discuss dynamics, uh, the question we ask is really the following. 
if I give you initial conditions, that is, I consider all possible x of t satisfying these two initial conditions. All right? uh, uh, these are the usual ways of specifying uh, uh, the class of paths we consider. Only those that satisfy certain initial conditions, which is the correct one. All right? So that is the question uh, uh, we ask in Newtonian mechanics. Right? And uh, the answer uh, that Newton uh, gives uh, is the following that of all possible x of t satisfying those two initial conditions, the correct one is the one that satisfies this equation, Newton's law of motion. Ma is equal to the force, and in Newtonian mechanics, the force is the negative gradient of a potential function. Right? So, so that is Newtonian mechanics uh, uh, in, in two lines. Right? Now, uh, in the least action principle, we try to treat this problem in a totally different uh, concept. And the idea is the following. First of all, you consider all possible paths P. And for each path, you calculate a real number, which is called the action S that depends on the path. And the action has to be additive uh, in a sense that I will explain later. And uh, the rule now is that the path which gives the minimum S is the correct path. So the correct path is not defined by a differential equation, but by choosing the one with the minimum s. Okay? So that is the, uh, the least action principle. So let me go through these concepts uh, in turn. So what, is, what do I mean by a path? Uh, in this context, uh, first of all, I start with endpoints. That is, I consider uh, the particle at position x1 at time t1, initial uh, position, and at x2 at uh, time t2. And uh, there is, of course, only one correct path. That's not strictly true if the two points are far apart. There may be more than one. But if they're not too far apart, uh, there is only one correct path. And say it is that one, that function x of t. But I will consider any other path uh, linking these two points. All right? but, so now by a path, I don't mean a path that satisfies the equation of motion. All right? Just draw anything. Any function x of t is called a path. So a path uh, simply means a function x of t. Okay? So whenever I say path p, I mean a function x of t. Uh, that satisfies uh, these two conditions. That I fix the initial point and fix the final point. That's what I mean by path. So how does the least action principle work in Newtonian mechanics? I, I'm sure you know. So uh, I will go back to Newtonian physics, and I will simply guess the form of the action and then I will obtain the equation of motion from S. All right, and I will just uh, start with an example, uh, uh, without, uh, uh, which is a particle uh, of mass m moving in one dimension, all right? just a simple case, and subject to a potential v of x. Now, the concept of additivity uh, means the following, that if the path is made up of many segments, of course, the path is a curve. A curve can always be approximated by a, a series of straight lines, piecewise linear. So I think of it as pieces of straight lines. All right? Additive means that the action for the whole path uh, can be obtained by calculating the action for each segment and adding it up. That's what I mean by additivity. So the only thing I need is to tell you a rule for the action for a short path. Okay? So uh, I just need to look at the short path, which is centered at t and x, and uh, a, a, a certain segment. Uh, and the length is delta t uh, on one side and delta x on the other side. All right? And the action for this path obviously must be proportional to the size of that segment. That is a consequence of additivity. Right? Because if I chop it in two, additivity means uh, and they are close to each other then the action for each half of the segment must be the same. Right? So uh, the, the total action must be proportional to the size of that segment. And if I label the size of that se segment by delta t, then it must be something times delta t. And that coefficient L, which is the action per unit time, is the definition of the Lagrangian. Now, this is one thing that you may not be clearly aware of. Uh, maybe you had learned that the Lagrangian was t uh, kinetic energy minus potential energy. Uh, that's not the correct definition. This is the correct definition, correct and general definition. All right? so it's the action per unit time. So, and what is the action then? Well, uh, the action can only depend on t, x, and x dot. 
all right? Because it depends on the center of, of that segment and depends on the slope of that segment, nothing else. And what is it? Well, I will simply give you the ansatz, all right? Uh, uh, the ansatz, uh, as, as you know, is the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. Uh, and I will show you, uh, and I'm sure you know this already, how this leads to the Newtonian laws of motion, all right? Uh, but I want to emphasize that this uh, formula, kinetic energy minus potential energy, is not the general definition. All right? And the general definition is, is simply this, that the action is related to the Lagrangian in this form. Oh, by the way, uh, feel free to in, uh, raise hands and interrupt and ask questions. All right? uh, uh, just to remind you of some mathematical terms, uh, normally when you talk about function, uh, f is equal to f of x, that means x the independent variable is a number, and that maps into another number, which is called uh, uh, f, and that is called a function, right? Now, uh, the concept of action uh, means that for every path, which I know, uh, denote as x of t, I calculate a number s. The path is itself a function. x of t is a function. Think of it as a curve, right? So the concept of action maps a path into a number or in other words, maps a function into a number, and this sort of uh, uh, object is called a function node, right? Fan uh, han, right? Fan han, okay? So uh, just take a very simple example. If I take a stone of mass S, M, which is thrown upwards from the ground and returns to the ground after a time capital T, uh, what is the trajectory uh, X, all right? And uh, so let me uh, take X to point upwards, uh, gravity down, and so the particle, of course, goes like this and co comes back down. Okay? So, uh, obviously, it must, the curve must look something like this. Okay? Goes up and then comes down. Of course, you know it's a parabola curve. Okay? Uh, but, uh, uh, and you know the, uh, what the answer is. But let's pretend we don't know. Let me guess a form that looks like this. Now, this is a form that uh, nails it down at zero, at t equals zero and nails it down at zero at capital T. And if I assume it is a quadratic function, the only possibility is this with an unknown coefficient, which I call A, all right? Now, that could be a wrong guess. Maybe it's not a quadratic function, it's a quartic function. Then by minimizing over this class, I would not get the correct answer, okay? Uh, but if I choose my class of function correctly, then I would get the exact answer. If I choose the, my class of functions approximately over a y class, I would still get a good approximate answer. That's uh, often the power of variational principles. So let me try to determine the coefficient a by this method, all right? So uh, the exercise is to calculate s in terms of a and ask what value of a makes it a minimum. Right. Did I assign this as a problem? No, I, I think not. Originally, I was going to, but, but let, let's just uh, do it. Uh, you can go home and, and check it. If you just plug it into the formula, all right? Because you have a formula for x of t, so you have x dot, and you uh, put one half m x dot square and integrate. That gives you the first term, all right? And the second term is the uh, uh, minus mg x integral, okay? Now, uh, you can easily uh, uh, imagine that the first term goes like a square and the second term goes like a, because x is proportional to a, remember? So x dot is proportional to a, so the kinetic energy is x dot square goes like a square. The second term is minus mg x, x goes like a, so it goes like a. Right? Now, you should develop a habit when you do calculations to focus on these features. Right? So the first thing you should notice is that kinetic term uh, goes as a square, and then minus the potential term which goes as a. Right? Uh, the rest are just constants that you work out. So you ask what value of A uh, would make this, uh, so that is S, so what value of A would make this minimum? And that, of course, determines what A is. Uh, it is G over 2, which you can check is, of course, a, the answer that even high school students would know. Okay? And this is the uh, uh, correct uh, function for X of T. So uh, that's just a trivial example. So, uh, but of course, this kind of derivation is correct only if we know the form of x of t. In this case, I guess it's a quadratic. If it's not a quadratic, I didn't guess it right, I wouldn't get the correct answer. So the question is, uh, for example, if x of t is given by this kind of a function for certain examples, 
uh, uh, I didn't guess it right, I wouldn't get the answer. So we need a method that does not assume a specific form of uh, the function. So how do we do this? Uh, and let's see, try to derive the equation of motion. Uh, so let's assume that this is the correct path, which we don't know at the moment. And uh, let me consider a neighboring path, all right? uh, which is x of t plus eta of t, where eta is very small. That's what I mean by uh, uh, neighboring. All right? So I calculate only to first order in t. Uh, and of course, because these two paths must start and end at the same point, eta must vanish at the end points. That's always uh, a, a rule in uh, principles of least action. And what we want is that these two paths uh, must give actions that are the same up to first order. Uh, that's the usual rule. When you have a function at a minimum, that means the first order variation is zero. That's why a derivative is zero. Now, that's a necessary sub a condition for a minimum. It's, uh, it could be a maximum. It could be a stationary point. Uh, I won't deal with this uh, 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 in this lecture. You can easily uh, check that the correct path cannot be a maximum. That that's, uh, uh, cannot be a maximum of the uh, action uh, because uh, it's very easy to construct another path uh, that increases the action. Okay? Uh, the way to do this is the following. If you have a path like this, uh, and if I now consider another path uh, like this that stays close to this but uh, goes like this. Okay? Uh, then you can easily show that the kinetic energy will be about the same. Uh, the potential energy will be about the same, but the kinetic energy will be larger. Okay? Uh, so uh, uh, the jacket path will always increase the action. Okay? So it cannot be a maximum. But, but I, I will uh, uh, skip over this. So the uh, principle of least action in operation simply means you demand that the first order variation must be zero, that any difference occurs only in the second order and higher. So as a shorthand, we'll simply say that delta S, by which I mean that difference to first order, has to be zero. That's the principle of uh, stationary action, shall we say. So uh, let's look at a small segment uh, and uh, make sure that we get our notation straight. Uh, the uh, triangular delta uh, will mean a small segment. Uh, the Greek a little delta will mean the difference between neighboring paths. Okay. So uh, if I take uh, this minus this, oops, uh, I would denote, uh, I lost it. Let's see, where should I? So uh, if I write little delta, the, the, the second delta here, I mean, say, the orange minus the green, okay? What? okay. So uh, let's calculate uh, the change in the action. So it's very simple. I calculate the action for x plus eta. That's the first line. And I calculate uh, the action for the original x. I expand in powers of eta to first order. Then, of course, uh, the only term uh, are the following. There is one term involving x dot coming from the, first, from the kinetic term. So uh, uh, this cross term, when you take the square, gives this term. And then this term, when you expand, gives a partial derivative of v with respect to x times eta. All right? So always, you get some linear function uh, 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 dependence on eta. One term involving eta dot, one term involving eta. That's always what happens. Now, uh, eta dot and eta are not independent, so we have to do something, and the usual rule uh, is the following. Uh, if I look at the x dot, eta dot, uh, then by just an identity in, in uh, I guess it's called integration by parts, you can write it as a total derivative uh, minus the other term. Okay? So if I take this total derivative, for instance, the first term involves m x double dot eta, and that's cancelled by this term. And the other term is m x dot eta dot, which is the term I want. Okay? So I always do this. And uh, this total derivative then can be integrated. You just cancel this dt with this dt, and you simply get uh, this square bracket evaluated at the endpoints. And these two terms are both proportional to eta, which I pull out. 
Right? So uh, that's all there is to it. And uh, I just summarize like this. And of course, the first term is 0 because eta vanishes at the endpoints. And in the second term, because eta is arbitrary, you have one, one function of t multiplied by an arbitrary eta of t integral is always 0 because I demand this to be 0. Therefore, I find uh, that this uh, big bracket must be 0. And that is, of course, uh, the Newton's law of physics, uh, of uh, uh, motion. So, so that is a basic derivation. Uh, so this refers uh, to uh, a case where the action is t minus v. But later, we will deal with cases where the, uh, it doesn't look like this. All right? And even the t is not simply given by x dot squared. You have done an example uh, in circular motion or in polar coordinates. Uh, where the kinetic energy is not simply, say, phi dot square, right? Uh, uh, the coefficient of phi dot square is not a constant. There is a factor r square. So for more general forms of the action, uh, the uh, derivation I just gave was not uh, strictly correct. And the general statement is the Euler-Lagrange equation, which, of course, you know. And so let me deal with this general form, and I will simplify the notation a little bit. First point is that L need not be t minus v. So it's just an arbitrary function of x and x dot. And uh, eta, which is the change of the path, uh, I will simply write as delta x. Okay? Remember, this little delta always means the difference between neighboring paths. So that is a consistent notation. And the integration by parts, uh, you can always remember in the following way. That whenever you see something like a, b dot, you just move the dot to the other factor and change the sign. Uh, because the difference is the derivative of AB, right? Which integrates to the points, to the endpoints, all right? So uh, let me perhaps uh, write this down. Uh, AB dot is actually is equal to DDT of AB uh, minus uh, A dot B. And this will integrate, if you put this under an integral sign, uh, this will integrate to the endpoints, and we always force uh, things to vanish at the endpoints. So this uh, really doesn't matter. Therefore, under an integral sign, you can always uh, uh, simply do this kind of replacement whenever you want. That's a shorthand, right? Uh, we don't need to say uh, quite as much. So uh, the action is given by the time integral of the Lagrangian. So the change in the action, that is the comparison with the neighboring path, is the time integral of the difference in the Lagrangian. And by the chain rule, not the chain rule, the partial derivative rule. Since L depends on x and x dot, uh, it is uh, the sum of two terms, one because the x argument has changed, one because the x dot argument has changed. Right? Now, uh, there is a rule uh, that happens all the time, uh, which sometimes goes by a shorthand, uh, which I need to explain. You see, in this term, you have delta x dot. Delta x dot really means delta and then time derivative, right? The dot means the time derivative. In this order, it means take the time derivative first and then take the variation later. I claim you can switch the order of these two things. Right? And that always happens. And that is another rule you should remember. In future, whenever you see these things, just do it. Okay? Now, why is that the case? Now, that looks a little bit abstract, but if you... Uh, so that's a rule I want to uh, 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 explain. If you draw things out, uh, you can see this uh, very uh, easily. Because you see, if I look at this one, I first take the time derivative and then I take the delta. Time derivative means, say, b minus a, right? Or d minus c. Later time minus earlier time, along the same path. And then I take the delta, then I mean, I don't know whether I have the formula here. Yeah. For example, if I take the time derivative for the original path, the green path, I mean b minus a, divided by delta t. All right? I hope you, I'm being schematic. The time derivative for the yellow path is d minus c. So if I look at this object, first take the time derivative, then take the delta, I mean this expression minus this expression. You get this thing. Is that okay? What if I do it the other way around? If I take the delta at time t, 
That means I take the difference between yellow and green at time t, that is c minus a. If I take the delta at the later time, that means d minus b, right? So if I take delta first and then take time, time derivative, I mean this minus this, right? Uh, you don't need to copy. All, all this is in, in, in the uh, PowerPoint slides on the web. So it means uh, this, okay? And if you just look at it, these two expressions are the same. The argument is, is actually the same as the usual argument for being able to interchange partial derivatives. Okay, uh, uh, One is sort of like a, a vertical difference, vertical meaning yellow minus green. The other is like a horizontal difference, later time minus earlier time. Okay? So uh, uh, that is the, the reason for being able to swap these things. Uh, but having argued it once, in future you just swap. Right? Derivatives and delta can always be uh, commuted. Okay, so uh, going back, uh, we have this. Uh, because I can now swap the time derivative and the delta, I move the time derivative to the outside. Then I use uh, these other rule, which allow me to say, you see, uh, a b dot is minus a dot b. Okay? I just move the time derivative to the other factor with a minus sign. Okay? And now both terms are proportional to delta x which I pulled outside, so I just repeat this line. And since delta x is arbitrary, I find that this square bracket is zero, and that is called the Euler-Lagrange equation. Now, in this derivation, I have not said, first of all, that x is a Cartesian coordinate. Okay? Could be any coordinate. Could be polar coordinates, could be generalized coordinates, could be anything. I did not say that L is T minus V, okay? So that is the power of the Euler-Lagrange equation. Works for any form of Lagrangian, works for any coordinates, and takes the same form in every set of coordinates. Now, the exercise I made you do, uh, the first, I think one of the first assignments, was to look at, say, a particle moving in circular motion, and to show that this form applies even if you, pol you use polar coordinates. Whereas f equals ma, if you just take that form blindly, that does not work in polar coordinates. Right? Uh, the r, second time derivative of r is zero right? in circular motion. d squared r dt squared is zero, but there is a radial force. Okay? So this is one advantage of the action formalism or the Euler-Lagrange equation compared to New Newton's laws. The same form works in all corner systems. Okay? Absolutely the same form. Okay. Now, uh, you see this factor, which appears all the time, that the partial derivative of L with respect to the velocity, uh, this occurs all the time and is called the conjugate momentum P. Need not be the same as MV, because X need not be a Cartesian corner. If x, say, is the angle phi, okay, then p does not even have the units of mass times velocity because x dot in that case is phi dot, which does not have units of meter per second, simply radians per second. Okay? So that's called the conjugate momentum. Uh, and whereas the velocity I will denote as pi sometimes, that's mv. And, and we will see that difference uh, later. This will be important uh, when we come to gauge theories. So uh, P is uh, defined as uh, that partial derivative, and the Euler-Lagrange equation can be written also in this form, that the time derivative of P is just uh, the derivative of L with respect to X. Okay? Uh, then I very quickly come to Hamiltonians. Uh, the Hamiltonian I first define as a function of three variables regarded, first of all, as independent. Position, velocity, and momentum. And I define as simply px dot minus l. Now, you, you, I'm sure you know all this, right? Uh, it may seem a bit strange when you first see it, but I think, I believe, next lecture, you will see this come out actually very naturally uh, from the po quantum point of view, right, this particular structure. Now, although x is defined as a function of three variables, position, velocity, and momentum, 
it actually is independent of velocity. Why? Let's look at it. If I differentiate with respect to velocity, then you work it out. In uh, this factor, I get p. In this factor, I get the partial derivative of l with respect to x dot. But, but by the definition of p, this is 0. right? So the Hamiltonian, in effect, is a function of only two variables, position and momentum. Okay? That can always uh, be written. What about the Hamiltonian equation of motion? Well, if you look at how h depends on p, then you just differentiate this expression. Then that kills that p, is x dot. If you see how h depends on x, you differentiate this expression. You only have to differentiate this x. So you get minus dl dx, and that is minus p dot. So the Hamilton equations of motion is that x dot is given by this, p dot is given by this. So if I have an expression for h, I will have two equations, or in general two n equations, each first order for how each variable changes in time. I, I'm sure you know all this. I don't need to belabor the, the point. Uh, of course, h is constructed to be conserved. And of course, that's when there is no explicit time dependence. And you can derive this very easily. How does h change? Well, h depends on x and p. So the change in the value of h goes through the change in x and the change in p. But I know dh dx is related to p dot, and dh dp is related to x dot. So this is 0. Right? So that's a very easy proof that the Hamiltonian is conserved. And of course, the Hamiltonian is extremely important when you come to quantum mechanics. Uh, your usual formalism of quantum mechanics uses the Hamiltonian. Uh, that's why I want to mention this. And a few advantages of the least action principle. Uh, the first is that if I change my coordinate system, the simplest change is, say, I rotate my coordinate system. More generally, I go from rect rectilinear coordinates to, say, circular coordinates or generalized coordinates, whatever. Right? So I represent this schematically in this diagram by saying the path is the same. The two green lines are the same. I just change my coordinates. But since the action is defined for each path, it obviously remains unchanged under coordinate transformations. Okay? So the action is an invariant under a large class of coordinate transformations. So the statement, so the path is independent of coordinates. So when I use the rule that the action has to be minimum, obviously the path that I select is independent of coordinates, right? Whether you work in this coordinate system, this coordinate system, or that coordinate system, when I say minimum s, I must select the same path. So that means physics is independent of coordinates. That is very easy to guarantee, OK? Now, think about it. If you try to write down the Newtonian law, something like f equals ma, then in rectilinear coordinates, you, set, you, you write something like this. Uh, for example, fx is equal to m, right? In polar coordinates, you would write something like this. fr is m d square r d t square uh, plus or minus, minus r square, one single r. Plus or minus. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's right. Okay, so, so uh, the second term is the centrifugal force. All right? Uh, you, you've done this. So you write down this, you write down this. How do you know the solution of this and the solution of this gives you the same path? It's not so obvious, right? You have to do all kinds of transformations to uh, uh, check this. And if you use even messier coordinates, which uh, for those of you who have taken general relativity, uh, you, know, you have to use curvilinear coordinates. It becomes totally non-obvious. Whereas for the least action principle, that is absolutely obvious because the rule that you are imposing is on the path and this, I talk about an invariant. Now, these things are not invariants. Okay? Under coordinate transformations, all these things transform in a messy way. So it is very difficult to check or impose invariants in equations of motion. Much easier to impose it at the action level. Okay? So that is a very important rule. 
So the principle of least action will be automatically invariant. That, that is the first advantage. Uh, in terms of generalized coordinates, this is a related point that the Euler-Lagrange equation has the same form in all coordinates. And uh, uh, this is exactly this point, that in uh, uh, rectilinear coordinates, you have f is the second derivative of the coordinate times mass. But in other coordinates, the component of f is not m times the corresponding second derivative. Right? So the Newton's law does not take the same form in all coordinates whereas the Euler-Lagrange equation takes the same form in all coordinates. Uh, and and uh, the circular motion is, is one uh, very trivial example that even high school students know, really. All right? uh, but uh, euler -Lagrange, well, th this uh, you have done in your exercise, so I, I won't uh, talk about it. OK, uh, let me just pause for one moment here and ask whether there are questions before I come to the two examples. Yeah. I want to ask that uh, when you when you, when you talk about the, the least action as uh, simple, uh, you, uh, you consider the whole picture uh, from start point to end point and find out the, the least action to come. But uh, is it um, is it um, when in the real world when when a particle in the start point, uh, it will only 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 know the next motion, the uh, next next step, and then search uh, and, and then select uh, the the least action of next moment, but not of the whole path. So that uh, maybe, maybe uh, finally, is it only choose the local minimum path. It's not the real uh, minimum uh, path of the whole picture. Uh, for most cases, there is only one minimum. So local minimum equals global minimum. Now, I won't talk about complications. I mean, you can ask this question purely in the context of classical mechanics. Are there examples where there is a more than one local minimum? And I can give you a trivial example in the context not of uh, mechanics, but of optics. You know the principle, Fermat's principle of least time is, is conceptually roughly the same, right? So if this is a mirror, and I tell you uh, a light source is here, and I need the photon to come to this point. Now, obviously, there are two paths that are uh, correct. One is going like this, the other is going like this. Right? Both are local minimums of the Fermat action. Okay? And, and both are allowed. Now, which one it actually chooses depends on which way you send the photon initially. Okay? So there are uh, simple examples of where there, there is more than one solution. But, but why, when, when, when I use a, a particle movement, why the particle and know the whole, whole path before it, it moves from the... It doesn't need point. to know. It doesn't need to know. Uh, because, well, there are two, two uh, ways to look at this. Purely from the classical point of view, my answer is it doesn't need to know because it is equivalent to saying it obeys uh, Newton's laws of motion, which is a differential equation, meaning I only determine what happens at t plus delta t. Right? So it is one little time step at, at a time. It's equivalent, so it doesn't need to know the ultimate. But I will later come to the quantum description. And the quantum point of view is that actually it samples all paths. But in some sense, only the classical path is dominant. It's the only one you see when h bar goes to zero. All right? uh, it actually goes along all paths. Okay? And, and this is a very important concept. I will come to this in the next lecture. But, but isn't in the uh, context of uh, quantum theory that the, uh, the, the, uh, the field can be trapped in some uh, force vacuum? The, the, in that case, uh, uh, you see more than one uh, minimum of the action? No, that's a minimum of the potential energy. It's not a minimum of the action. Not a minimum of the action. OK, let me take an example of rel relativity, special relativity. All right? uh, now, uh, the action, I take a relativistic free particle. Okay? Now, and, and I chop up the paths into short segments. Then the action must be the sum of the action for each short, short segment. Now, a short segment is labeled by delta t, delta x, delta y, delta z. So in a time delta t, the particle moves delta x, delta y, delta z. The absolute position, the absolute time does not matter because it's a free particle. That means this position is the same as that position. x, y, z are irrelevant. Right? So uh, how can I write 
delta S in terms of these four small numbers that determine the line segment. Okay? And these are denoted as delta X mu. Uh, uh, I'm sure you know this, but uh, my notation will be uh, this one is uh, X0, uh, X1, X2, X3. All right? So mu takes uh, uh, values 0, 1, 2, 3. Well, delta S must have two properties. One, it, it must be linear in the size of the interval. That is, if I double delta T, delta X, delta Y, delta Z, then the action must also be doubled. Right? So that rules out things like, for example, if I was to write the action is equal to delta X squared, that will not work. That is not linear. Okay? The second thing is that it must be invariant under Lorentz transformations. How can I construct out of these four components something which is invariant under Lorentz transformations? Well, this is a four vector. Out of a four vector, you can construct only one thing that is invariant under Lorentz transformations. Uh, I will be using, I think, uh, units where c is equal to one. And the only thing you can construct is this object, right? That is the uh, uh, dot product, relativistic dot product of a four vector with itself. Okay? There's nothing else you can construct that is invariant. right? If I just pick some of the coordinates but not the others, or if I insert a factor of two in, some, in some one of these terms, that would not be an invariant object under Lorentz transformations. Okay? So that is the only thing you need to know. Now, but this object is invariant but not linear. Right? Because if I double everything, it gets multiplied by 4. So just imposing these two conditions, uh, you see that the only possibility uh, is the following. It's the square root of this object multiplied by some constant k. All right? uh, just look at the first line first. I, I, I will uh, come to the next line later. Just look at this line. This object, take the square root, multiply by any constant. That is the only possibility. Is that okay? by using these two conditions. That is the only possibility. Uh, by the way, you may say, why do I not reverse the sign here and take these positive and that negative? The reason, of course, is that for a particle moving delta x, delta y, delta z in de time delta t, delta t square must be larger than the spatial separation square. Because otherwise, the speed would be larger than 1. Right? One is the speed of light. Okay? So uh, in one year, it cannot move more than one light year. Okay? So the delta t term must be larger. Or in other words, the interval must be time-like. Right? Now, if I now divide everything by delta t square inside the square root sign and pull that delta t square outside as one power of delta t, then this becomes one. This becomes delta x over delta t squared. In other words, the x component of the velocity squared, y component of velocity squared, uh, z component of velocity squared. So overall, is k delta t times 1 minus the velocity squared. Is that OK? That's the only thing consistent with linearity and invariance. Okay? And as we said before, the action per unit time is the Lagrangian. So I immediately recognize the Lagrangian to be k times square root of 1 minus t squared. In some sense, k doesn't really matter because I will say choose the minimum action, right? So if your action is wrong by a uniform factor, the minimum is still the same path, right? Okay? So what the overall scale of the action is a matter of convention, really. Okay? Uh, I will choose k to be the correct convention, but it's really unimportant. Okay? So uh, uh, let's see uh, what this should be the value of k for the best consistency with uh, uh, what we know. If I look at small velocities, so small meaning compared to 1, that is non-relativistic, so I expand that square root, then I get 1 minus a half d squared. Uh, then compared with the Newtonian case, 
Now, if I stick this, by the way, if I stick this uh, under the integral sign, uh, the one gives you something trivial, right? Just a constant. And uh, in these action, action principles, you can always add or subtract a constant. Doesn't matter, okay? Because I, I just ask for the minimum. If everybody gets added uh, the same constant, it doesn't affect the choice of the minimum. So uh, what matters is this term, and it is minus a half kV squared for a free particle. But in Newtonian mechanics, we say it is one half mv squared, the kinetic energy, right? So to compare with that term, uh, k has to be minus m. Okay? So the Lagrangian for a relativistic free particle has to be like this. Is that okay? Now you see, I derived this with, with the minimum of assumptions. All right? And you also notice something. This looks rather messy. It's rather weird, you know, square root 1 minus v squared. I mean, doesn't look natural. But if you go back to uh, this expression, this looks perfectly natural, right? Okay. How come this very natural thing became this rather unnatural thing? It is because we have selected delta t. Now, delta s is a totally invariant quantity. Invariant means, in a sense, I treat t, x, y, z equally, right? But here I have selected the time direction as special. Okay? And therefore what remains is not something that is nice or invariant. Now, that also uh, explains that the action in many cases is better than the Lagrangian because the Lagrangian selects the time direction out of t, x, y, z. Whereas S does not make that selection. It's totally invariant. Okay? Right, let's see. So you have this. Once you have this, the rest is pretty straightforward. A uh, matter of just algebra, which you have done. And it's just a matter of, uh, you don't even have to think. Uh, the momentum, remember, is the derivative of L with respect to the velocity. Of course, you do it component by component, and you get this expression. Which, of course, we write as M gamma times V. So you get the relativistic expression for momentum with an extra factor of gamma, okay? Automatically. Once you think in the action type of way, that correction factor gamma comes out perfectly naturally, just through some algebra. So that is the, the mechanical momentum. And of course, the law of motion goes like this, and that uh, uh, shows, uh, this is for a free particle, this is of course conserved, uh, and of course comes with this expression. Now, we have the Lagrangian, we have the momentum, so by the usual rule, the Hamiltonian is x dot p minus l, right? x dot is velocity. Okay. Now, uh, by the way, uh, if it's one dimension, that is x dot times p, multiple dimension is a dot product. V dot P, all right? Then you just work this out, and you get this expression. I, I, I won't go through the algebra. You have done this. And you see, so, so you get, oh, sorry. So you get this formula saying that the Hamiltonian, or in other words, the energy for the particle is just mc squared times gamma, right? Now c is equal to 1, okay? So this extra factor of gamma for the relativistic energy also comes out naturally, right? You don't have to think. So, so that, uh, uh, these answers you don't know, you all know, but I just want to emphasize how it comes out very naturally and easily if you adopt the least action point of view as one of the advantages uh, of the principle of least action. Okay, Any questions? Now, in the rest of this course, we will be talking a lot about the quantum mechanics of a charged particle that is a charged particle in an EM field. When you talk about quantum mechanics, you need to have the Hamiltonian. And how do you get the quantum Hamiltonian? You use the classical Hamiltonian and turn P into an operator, right? That's the usual rule. So uh, in the, this part of the lecture, I want to quickly derive for you the Lagrangian and the Hamiltonian for a charged particle in an EM field. And again, you will find that the rather weird form of the Lorentz force law looks a bit strange, right? 
comes out very naturally uh, once you adopt uh, the uh, uh, action point of view. Okay? So all this is still a uh, class for mechanics. So I will ass assume there is a four vector uh, potential A mu. Oh, uh, let, let me just uh, go back to something more familiar first. You have all learned that uh, the magnetic field is, uh, can be described as curl A. I will use this symbol for three vectors. And you all know that the electric field can be written as uh, time derivative of phi minus, oh, sorry, time derivative of A minus uh, gradient of phi, right? Uh, uh, this is some classical EM. And phi and A, I will assume, form a four-vector uh, four potential. Okay? So suppose there is an object which is a four-vector potential. I write as A mu, A0, A1, 2, 3. And it transforms like a four-vector. And I assume uh, that uh, the presence of this field adds an interaction term to the action. So the action goes like this. The first term in black is what we have derived for a relativistic free particle. The presence of an EM field adds an extra term called the interaction term, which is linear, I assume, in the external potential. So uh, the potential enters uh, the interaction term linearly. Now let's look for a small segment of path. For a small segment of path, I want to construct an interaction potential that is linear in the potential and linear in the size of that segment. That is the law of additivity, right? Because if I consider double the segment, the corresponding term in the interaction potential should be doubled. And the whole thing has to be invariant, right? Every piece of the in, uh, action has to be invariant. So I have the following requirements for the interaction uh, uh, term. Has to be linear in the potential. Has to be linear in the size of the segment. Has to be invariant. Invariant under Lorentz transformations. So it has to be a four scalar. So the only possible thing is like this, right? It's a coefficient. E, which will later turn out to be the charge, times A mu times delta X mu. Oh, for those of you who have not taken the relativity course, uh, when I write A mu, B mu, I mean A0, zero, B0, zero, minus O. Oh. I think uh, I'm using that uh, metric in, in this course, that timeline matrix. A anyway, uh, it's the timeline component and the space-like component enter the dot product with opposite signs. Okay? I, I may have grouped some minor signs. but uh, okay. So that form is dictated by the requirements. Linearity in the potential, linearity in the size of the interval, and invariance. The only th thing you can do is to take an invariant dot product of the two four vectors. Okay? So that is the interaction potential, and E will turn out to be the charge. So uh, just from these principles, the action must look like this. Uh, by the way, uh, I have probably grouped quite a few minor signs, uh, depending on what dot product I use. This, this is delta, the one I just uh, erased. Uh, this is delta x uh, 0 squared minus delta x i squared. When I write i, I mean 1, 2, 3, all right? And, and this can be written as delta x mu, delta x mu, depending on how, how I choose the metric, okay? Uh, maybe, I think I moved the minus sign over. Let me see. Maybe not. So uh, very often I will write this as uh, dx mu, dx mu. Okay? Now you may be a little bit uh, perplexed by having a differential under an integral sign. That's not something you have ever learned in calculus. But what it means is just something like this, okay? You chop it into little intervals, delta x times delta x, 
and then sum. Right? Got, uh, the important thing is that all the expressions must be linear in the size of the interval, uh, then it becomes a sensible integral. Okay? Because whenever you turn a sum into an integral, you always mentally think you chop it smaller and smaller and take the limit. So if you chop it each interval into two, then each bit contributes only half the amount. So the two together contributes the same amount. Then as you chop, the limit will exist. Okay? So the linearity in the interval is a requirement for the limit to exist in going from delta to d. All, right? All that is taken for granted. Okay? So it looks like this. And, and so let's see what happens in this case. Now, so this is actually a very uh, uh, simple form. Uh, this is just a free particle. This is sort of the most natural form possible, right? And I will now derive the Lorentz force law uh, from this expression. And I think uh, you have done this as an exercise, so I will just take you very quickly uh, uh, through this. So I write this again in this form, right? Uh, the, the first part I uh, write out in terms of t. Now, in going from the previous slide to this slide, I have sacrificed overt or explicit invariance. The previous slide is, you know, look at it, invariant, in written in terms of four vectors. But in this form, at least in the first term, I have singled out t as special. That's my choice. That doesn't affect the physics. That affects the way I write my equations. So the equations that follow will not be explicitly invariant, right? They are invariant because I start from S, but it will not be obvious if you just look at the equations at the end, all right? But it will be more familiar, uh, uh, connect to things you learn even in high school, all right? So if I just peel off a time integral, then the rest is just uh, the Lagrangian, right? So uh, the first term is obvious, the second term, I divide by dt and multiply by dt. All right? The multiplication by dt is the integral, which I peel off. Then what I get is the Lagrangian. Looks like this. Okay? Now, uh, remember uh, that the four vector potential is phi times a and a, whereas dt, x mu by dt, that is uh, this factor, what is it? Well, the zero component, x0 is t itself. So dx0 by dt is just 1. And the spatial component, dx by dt, is just the velocity. Okay? So if you take this uh, dot product, uh, let me see. I guess I didn't goof the minus sign. Uh, my dot product is like this. Uh, if you take this dot product of this four vector times this four vector, and our rule is multiply the time components together with a minus sign and multiply the spatial components together with a plus sign. Okay? Is that all right? So that four-dimensional dot product between the potential and essentially the displacement gives you this expression, phi minus d dot a. Phi is the, uh, uh, this phi the electrostatic potential, the potential you learn in EM. So you see this combination comes out together all the time, phi minus V dot A, because it is part of a uh, four-dimensional dot product like this. This looks very natural. This may look slightly strange the first time you see it. Okay, so that uh, is the Lagrangian for a particle in a, an EM field. Any questions? Now, if you, sometimes in these things, uh, when you do these things, uh, it's very easy to make mistakes of minor signs. Uh, Why Lagrangian is a good quantity to uh, a good starting point in this uh, in this? Say that again. I didn't catch you. Why so, Lagrangian is a good uh, as a starting point? Why is it a good starting point? Yeah, for this case, but uh, why in the quantum mechanics, Hamiltonian is a... No, no, I will do it for Hamiltonian as well. Uh -huh. Because uh, uh, action relates more easily to the Lagrangian. Yeah. Uh, I will later do the Hamiltonian. Uh, but uh, in quantum field theories, Lagrangian is still a starting point. 
Mr. Sadam Honya. But uh, why not, uh, not, not a Hamiltonian? Oh, Hamiltonian. The, the, the reason is the following. Hamiltonian is not invariant. Uh, so in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, you don't worry about invariant, right? So Hamiltonian is fine. Okay? Now, in relativistic quantum mechanics, Hamiltonian is not fine. Lagrangian is also not fine. Lagrangian density is okay. Why? What you see is not the Lagrangian, but the Lagrangian density. The action is Lagrangian dt, right? If I write the Lagrangian as the Lagrangian d3x, okay? the script L is the Lagrangian density, it's the Lagrangian per unit volume. Then you see this guy is invariant. These four guys together is invariant. That's like, just like normally in space, you have d3x. That means dx, dy, dz. That is invariant with respect to rotations, right? If I just take dx, that is not invariant to rotations. So by the same token, if I write dt, dx, dy, dz, the four-dimensional volume, that is invariant to Lorentz transformations. So if this is invariant, this is invariant, then this is invariant. Okay? So in quantum field theory, your starting point is the Lagrangian density, not the Lagrangian. And, and so you just write down an invariant Lagrangian density, and that's a good starting point. Okay. Now, uh, s the fact that these two have opposite signs is easy to remember because uh, you know in a four-dimensional dot product, uh, the time and the space components always have different signs. Now, which is plus, plus, which is minus depends on which book you read, all right? Because uh, the conventions for dot product for four vectors may, may differ. But the one thing that is always true is that they have different signs. That's one thing to remember. Secondly, is it minus plus or plus minus? Go back to the case where there is no magnetic field and non-relativistic particles. Then, of course, this becomes one-half mv squared, right? This we have uh, derived. Now, it should be t minus v, right? Minus the potential energy. Well, it's minus the potential energy, OK? The potential energy is the charge times the potential. Okay? So by making that comparison, you can easily remember that this is a minus sign. Okay? By this point, once I've reached this point, uh, I no longer depend on my four vector uh, conventions. All right? So that, that's uh, what happens. You know, sometimes I make mistakes uh, uh, in the intermediate step, but I know what the right answer is. All right? so, so, so check that. So that is the Lagrangian. Any question at this point? Now, from the Lagrangian, then I just apply the usual rules of Euler-Lagrange equations and see what happens. That's all there is to it. Let's see what happens, all right? Now, uh, first thing to note, the Lagrangian is not the kinetic energy minus the potential energy. In particular, A has nothing to do with the energy whatsoever. Think about magnetostatics. Suppose there's no electric field. Everything is not changing. B is equal to curl A. B doesn't cause any energy change, right? B does not do any work. So A has not, nothing to do with the energy. So the B dot A term certainly has nothing to do with any potential energy, right? And that's why I told you, don't think that uh, Ke minus Pe is a fundamental definition. No. The fundamental definition is that the action is the Lagrangian dt. Okay? That's the fundamental definition of the Lagrangian. So uh, let's work out the conjugate momentum. So conjugate momentum is the derivative of this thing with respect to velocity. So if you di differentiate this term, uh, you get the usual relativistic momentum. Uh, that is something the same as when you discuss a free particle. You have done this already. But in addition, you differentiate with respect to v, you also have this term. So you get Ea, right? and that's uh, for every component. Now, this is the mechanical momentum, mv times gamma. P is not the mechanical momentum. For example, if the particle is not moving, just standing still in a magnetic field, P is not zero. It is Ea. Okay? So when you see P, or, or for many applications, we'll 
take the non-relativistic case, right, for, for many applications later. So forget the square root. When you see P, don't immediately say it is MV. It is MV plus EA. P is not the usual momentum. P is the conjugate momentum. Is that okay? Another thing that you should notice is that the actual momentum MV is P minus EA. P minus EA. That is a combination that will occur time and time and time again in the rest of this course. P minus EA. Okay? And this is where it comes from. So uh, the mechanical momentum, this term I will call pi sometimes, all right? Uh, so P is pi plus EA. So let's look at the Euler-Lagrange equations. It says the time derivative of P, now P, not MV, all right, is the gradient of L. So let's just write it down. So uh, P is pi plus EA. L, uh, there is a term involving the square root that is uh, purely kinetic. Uh, it, has, it does not depend on position. The only thing that depends on position is this, this P. Uh, it depends on position uh, implicitly through the following. I'm being a bit schematic here. I, I think uh, you, you know what I mean. Uh, of course, uh, whenever I write phi, I mean phi of x. And whenever I write a, I mean a of x, where x is the position of the particle. It's not an arbitrary point. Okay? So let's try to work this out. <coughs> uh, <coughs> and if you do this, I'm not going to, uh, you, you find that d pi dt is e times d plus v cos b. And, uh, and at the same time, you find that E is given by this and B is given by this. Now, notice one thing, uh, that when you try to calculate d pi dt, you have to move this term to the right-hand side. All right? And uh, moving that term to the right-hand side actually involves the following. Uh, I just write down the steps. Uh, I won't do the details. Uh, so you have on the right-hand side, you have a term minus E d dt of A. Uh, let's say I component. All right? Now, uh, this, this actually consists of two terms. How does this depend on T? Well, first of all, there is a partial derivative, right? Secondly, because AI depends on XJ and XJ depends on T. Right? There are these two terms. Okay? So the total time derivative of A consists of two parts. And of course, uh, this uh, is just the velocity. Okay? Now, I won't go through the uh, uh, detailed arithmetic. Uh, you will see the following. For example, these two terms, this dA dt will contribute to this term. This Velocity times a spatial derivative of A will contribute to a V cross B. The spatial derivative of A uh, comes into here. And also, uh, in this X derivative, in this term, uh, d phi dx will, of course, contribute to this term. And then there is another term, which is dA dx. Okay? And in fact, this dA dx and this dA dx will combine to give you the curve. Now, you have all done this yourself, right? Uh, any questions about this? Do I, do I, have you done, the, you haven't had time to, uh, you, so, so, so you know all, all, all the uh, algebraic steps, okay? So uh, I just want to, I, I don't want to spend time doing algebra here. I think you can, you can all do this. And, and the point really is this, that this is the Lorentz force law, which you learned in year one. Not exactly in this form, but basically you, you know this. And it's actually kind of strange, right? Whereas it all comes from a term uh, in the action, uh, simply a mu dx mu, okay? Uh, which is actually much more natural and simple looking. Adding this 
to the action is equivalent to stating this law. And that is really uh, an advantage of the action principle. Okay? I, I think in your uh, first exposure to the least action principle in classical mechanics, probably uh, there was not much attention to uh, EM problems, especially magnetic uh, problems. Okay, so that was, uh, the details was, was an exercise. Uh, uh, I, oh, uh, okay, so, so uh, that's left hand exercise. Now, uh, next, uh, let me talk about the Hamiltonian. So we have this uh, uh, Lagrangian, which we have derived. And we know that uh, P is pi plus EA. By the way, these two should be both. And pi is the mechanical momentum. So let's calculate the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is V dot P minus Lagrangian. So it is V dot into this thing, okay? So it's V dot pi and then V dot EA, so that's the first term, minus Lagrangian. Now notice the V dot A term cancels, okay? So you have V dot pi plus M times the square root plus E phi. And let's just uh, do some algebra. So it's a v dot pi plus this plus e phi. Now, notice, I mean, uh, the first two terms have nothing to do with the fields. It's just the velocity and the mechanical momentum. The mechanical momentum is sort of like mv. So you just write out what pi is, and you just simplify, all right? And uh, after some simplification, it just becomes this term. Uh, that's actually not surprising, because that's exactly what you did in the case of the free particle. There's no phi, there's no a, okay? So this is the Hamiltonian. Now, does this make sense? Of course it makes sense, because the first term is just the kinetic energy. The second term is the potential energy, plus. And a does not appear. Notice, if I write it in this form, which is not the proper form for writing the Hamiltonian, by the way. Hamiltonian should always be expressed in terms of position and momentum, not position and velocity. Okay? Now, if when, when P is equal to MV, the difference is, is trivial. It's just a fact of M. It doesn't really matter. But now P, the difference between P and V is non-trivial. So this is not the proper way of writing it. But in terms of its numerical value, it's okay. The first term is the kinetic energy. If V is small, it's just one-half MV squared. That's a constant. And the second term is just the electrostatic energy. And if you want to ask what is the energy of a particle in an E, M field, you can totally forget about the magnetic field, right? So you see A does not appear, okay, in this, in this expression. Okay. So now, we arrive at this expression. Now, this is the relativistic energy. Of course, you can write it as pi squared plus m squared square root. That is the usual statement in special relativity that the energy of a particle is just mass squared plus momentum squared square root, okay? That's just, the, you, you just prove it by handling all the one minus V squared and so on. Nothing to do with fields, okay? And uh, for simplicity, <coughs> I would just do the non-relativistic case from now on. Non-relativistic means that the momentum is much smaller than the mass. In other words, MV is much smaller than mc. So I expand the square root. This is the large term, and I expand this to first order, so it's m plus pi squared over 2m. That, again, has nothing to do with em. It's just your usual mechanics saying that the total energy of a particle is mc squared plus momentum squared divided by 2m. Momentum squared divided by 2m is just Newton and you just added a constant rest energy, mc squared to it. That's all there is to it. So that is the energy. But again, that is not the right way to write the uh, uh, Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian should be written in terms of p, right? Remembering how pi is related to p, you get uh, the following expression, that the Hamiltonian is some constant, which is irrelevant, and I will drop it henceforth, 1 over 2m, P minus E A squared plus E phi. Okay? Remember, P is the conjugate momentum. Hamiltonian should always be written in terms of P and position. P 
position is hidden in terms of the argument of A and phi. So this is the Hamiltonian for a particle in an EM field. Right? P minus EA all the time. This is a thing that will be a theme in this course, P minus EA. This is how it comes about. Now, I could have done all this in a relativistic way. Okay? Uh, you see, P and A are now three vectors. I could do it with four vectors. There is a, actually a four-dimensional P. Oh, in fact, I can do it right away. Move this to the other side. You have H minus E phi appearing. What is H? H is the energy. Energy is P0. What is phi? Phi is A0. So when you move it to the other side, it is the zero component of P minus EA. Okay? So P minus EA four vector, all four components appear naturally. All right? But uh, because the rest of this course, I want to introduce the key ideas in the simplest possible fashion. I won't do this uh, in the relativistic context. I will just do this uh, in the non-relativistic context, and that's the Hamiltonian. Now, uh, I think I have more than enough time, so uh, I will now just pose a very important question. And the resolution of this question will be one of the key things in this course. You have all learned in EM that A is to some extent arbitrary. Right? <clears throat> so for the same physics, you can use two different sets of A's. They differ by gauge transformation by the gradient of some function, right? You all learn this in classical uh, EM. So if you use one A and you use another A and put into here, how do you guarantee you get the same answer? That the motion or the solution that you find is the same. You understand the question? Now, in classical mechanics, the answer is simple. Because this will lead to equations of motion namely the one I just derived, which does not involve A itself, but only curl A, right? The equation of motion I derived involves only B equals curl A. So you use one A, you use another A, your curl A must agree, even if your A do not. So no problem. What about quantum mechanics? Now, in quantum mechanics, you know this P becomes minus I h bar gradient. Right? So uh, in quantum mechanics, uh, let's say non-relativistic quantum mechanics, uh, what you have is the following. It's uh, 1 over 2m minus i h bar gradient minus e a squared plus e phi operating on the wave function psi is equal to e psi. Right? If I want to solve for a stationary state, that is what I want to solve. The rule that you have learned in quantum mechanics is to turn a conjugate momentum into the gradient operator by this rule. Okay? So you have one A, you solve this equation. You have another A, you solve this equation. How do you guarantee you two get the same answer for the same E? Well, same, side, same wave function. Wave function cannot be the same. But it must describe the same physics. Now, that means you have, how, how we guarantee the two E's are the same, we have to worry about. How do we guarantee the two sides to be nearly the same? Nearly the same means they differ only in the irrelevant aspects. What is the irrelevant aspect of a wave function? Phase factor. Now, so that gives you a hint. Is the gauge transformation in EM changing A to another A, which differs by gradient lambda, let's say. And the phase transformation on the wave function, are they related? OK? Is it possible to do the two together and still map a solution into a solution? If not, we are in trouble. Do you understand? OK, let me repeat. You have learned two things which are to some extent arbitrary. In your EM course, you know that A is to some extent arbitrary. You can add a gradient to it. 
in quantum mechanics, you have learned that the phase of the wave function is to some extent arbitrary. You can rotate it by a certain phase theta. The deep idea in this course, one of the deep ideas, is that these two are related. Okay? The angle theta, uh, let me just uh, write this down. You can change A into A minus gradient lambda, let's say. Lambda is a scalar. You can change psi into psi e to the i theta. And uh, it turns out that theta and lambda are related by a certain factor. I don't know which factor. Uh, e, probably e over h bar or something. I, I can't guarantee the minus sign. All right? uh, we, we'll, we'll do the details later. It turns out if you do both of these transformations together with theta and lambda related in this way, then it remains a solution. All right, now, two things that you have sort of learned separately, one thing in the EM course, one thing in the quantum mechanics course. They are deeply related. And this is the simplest example of what is called a gauge transformation. Okay? And it comes about because in the quantum mechanical equations of motion, P and A appear in non-trivial ways. P minus E A always together. Another set of deep questions that we will uh, address is that to what extent is A physical? A is obviously too much information, right? If I tell you A, there is something that's irrelevant because I can change it by gradient lambda and it's described the same physics. So A is obviously too much information. Is B just, just turns out not. The right amount of information is something in the middle, a little bit more than B, a little bit less than A, right? And, and we will come to these uh, uh, in, in later lectures. Right? And it all, uh, the starting point for all this is the quantum mechanical H that corresponds to this formula. The only change is change P into this gradient operator. All right? So uh, this is uh, what I just said later, that uh, since H involves A and A is arbitrary to some extent, uh, how do you resolve this? Paradox. Okay. Uh, oh, one thing I didn't do, and I think I even forgot to uh, set an. Did I set an example? Take this. Apply the Hamilton equations of motion. And again, derive the Lorentz force law. You understand? P dot is related to dh dx. X dot is related to dh dp. Uh, I think if, if I didn't assign this, uh, uh, you should do that as well. Okay. Now, notice A appears in, in, a, in a rather strange way. Even though A does not contribute to the energy, that's why H cannot be thought of simply as the energy. The magnetic field does not contribute to the energy, but it makes an appearance in H, provided you express H in terms of P, not in terms of B. Okay? The rule is that you have to express in terms of P. Right, uh, I'm thinking we're well ahead of time. Uh, I thought I had too much to cover, but uh, so uh, time for questions. But most of this is, is review, I think, just helping you look at things you know from a slightly fresh perspective. Right. Except for this final thing, it's all classical. Right, it's a review of classical physics. Oh, and by the way, of course, uh, stating the Newtonian laws of physics in terms of a minimum principle, that idea generalizes way beyond uh, uh, Newton's laws of physics. And in the exercises, I have given you some examples where other laws of physics can be uh, expressed as minimum principles. And the example I gave you was just the most trivial one. Uh, that's uh, idea number one. Idea number two is that once you express it in terms of minimum principles, that gives you sometimes an efficient recipe, numerical recipe for finding the answer. That is often very efficient. And the example I gave you is like the, called the relaxation method for solving either the Laplace equation or the Poisson equation. Okay.
actions. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. And in and the list action principle can connect to the uh, quantum, um, quantum mechanics and the classical mechanics. So there's a thing that uh, like when h bar equal, uh, is approximate to zeros, and then this two two cases uh, can equal. So I I, I don't quite understand what uh, h bar is a constant. How how can say that? Uh, oh, how can h bar go to zero? Yeah. Okay. No. Uh, as I will show next time, uh, the quantum mechanical phase uh, is given by e to the i action divided by h bar. Now, of course, uh, something I haven't emphasized, which I should have, action has the same unit as h bar. Because action is Lagrangian dt, Lagrangian has the same unit as Hamiltonian, so the unit is Hamiltonian times time, or energy times time. So when we say formally h bar going to zero, what we mean is a situation where the action is much, much larger than h bar. That is, s over h bar is a huge number, 10 to the 20 or something. Now, normally, I mean, in classical physics, you are talking about you know, all quantities in MKS units of order one, let's say, you know, one kilogram of something moving one meter in one second, that sort of thing. So the action in MKS units is order one h bar is 10 to the minus 34 mks units. So in the sort of situation we are thinking about, the phase has a unit of 10 to the 34. So if you change the path by one part in 10 to the 34, right, from here to here, you can't even see it, right? Change in the 34 significant digit. S changes in, by one part in 10 to the 34. The phase changes by one. So unless you are at a point of stationary phase. Once you change uh, the path by that tiny bit, the phase changes by many times 2 pi. And when you add it up, it all cancels out. Right? Uh, that, of course, um, in a mathematical sense, relates to a state, uh, integrals with stationary phase. That if you do an integral, uh, uh, and this is an exercise that I think I have already assigned, uh, for example, if you do an integral like this, see if I remember. Uh, this is not exactly the same as uh, the one I assigned, but it's related. Suppose I want you to do an integral like this. Right? E to the i f of x divided by epsilon. And I ask about this uh, 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 integral when epsilon is very, very small. Uh, mathematically, I say the asymptotic limit when epsilon goes to zero. Now, it can be shown that it will be dominated by uh, e to the i f of x0, where uh, x0 uh, is a stationary point. Okay? Uh, if there is more than one stationary point, you, you may have to add it up. Uh, Times something. Uh, the something is uh, slightly more complicated. And, and that's something actually not difficult to derive. You just expand f around that stationary point. The zero order term I have pulled out. First order term is by definition zero. So the next term, which you need to calculate, is actually like this, is uh, dx e to the i f double prime of x naught divided by 2 x minus x naught squared divided by epsilon, right? And that's just a Gaussian integral, which you, you, can, you can do. It is just the one over the square root of this guy, OK? Uh, of course, to leading order in epsilon. Okay? So when you add up many things where the phase is os oscillating very rapidly, as characterized by a small number in the denominator, then the dominant contribution, the only thing you need to think about, is the point uh, where uh, the phase is stationary. So actually, it is not the h bar go to zero. Actually, it's the action has a microscopic change. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. No, whenever we say something is small, it always means in relation to something else. Oh, oh uh, by the way, uh, people sometimes ask the question, you know, can we derive the value of h bar? So fundamental. And I think I've told some of you that uh, that's a silly question. Because anything carrying units has no physical meaning, no intrinsic physical meaning. Because you say h bar is so much kilogram meter per second and so on, right? Uh, that value depends on what you mean by kilogram. Uh, and you know the original kilogram was defined as a piece of platinum in Paris. You know? 
if in, in that year somebody decided to chop a bigger piece, the definition of kilogram would have changed, right? And the value of each bar in MKS units would have changed. So that number, that particular number depends on how the kilogram was chopped in you know, 150 years ago. And of course, that is not a, a property of nature. That's purely arbitrary. Right? So whenever you mention kilogram, meter, second, the number contains information that relates to a, an arbitrary decision, sometimes somewhere. And therefore, that number has no meaning. Okay? But if you ask what is the ratio between the proton mass and the electron mass, 1836 or whatever. Now, that is totally independent of what I mean by kilogram. So that is an intrinsic question. Okay? So the only numbers that may have an explanation are dimensionless numbers. Dimensionless because it does not depend on human definitions of what is a kilogram and so on. Okay? So for numbers that have dimensions, don't try to spend your life trying to find a theory to explain its value. There are people who do that. Okay? Uh, and, and in fact, the sensible thing is to just uh, call it one, choose a, a system of units where it is equal to one. Okay? Uh, uh, of course, you can't choose everything to be one, but uh, a certain set of three or four numbers to be one. Okay? And of course, the, the thing is, why in our daily world, the sort of actions we consider in units of H bar is huge. Okay? Uh, and that is what we mean by the formal statement, H bar going to zero. How about the speed of light? Speed of light. Uh, 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 if we cannot use the limit, then uh, which we need, uh, we, can, we can compare with the speed of light. Uh, has uh, no meaning. I mean, you can never derive uh, 3.0 times 10 to the 8, because that de depends on what you mean by a meter and a second. Right? The natural thing to do is to say use year and light year. Then C is by definition 1. So if you try to derive the, the value 3.0 times 10 to the 8, you are just trying to derive why we chose a meter to be this long and the second to be this length. Right? And obviously, the way the second was derived has something to do with the Earth and our solar system, right? Because it's based on our day. Right? So it's uh, totally arbitrary. I mean, somebody in some other solar system out there would certainly use a different unit. So, so, so 3 times 10 to the 8 has no significance. Any questions? Uh, any exercises, tricky ones that you haven't been able to cover? No. No. Okay. Uh, the first one you could all do con concerning black body radiation. That was a little bit tricky because uh, when Professor Yang, he first wrote down that equation, E equals to Ts minus Pv, I thought he was wrong, and I had a long argument with him uh, uh, because uh, I thought from general principles it cannot be true. But it turns out from general principle it is, cannot be true, but there, there is a loophole which works for uh, radiation. Okay. okay, so uh, if that's the case, we could break a little early. Uh, uh, and then, let's see, today is Wednesday. Friday, I will uh, relate this to uh, uh, quantum mechanics. That is, in fact, I will talk about uh, e to the is. Uh, okay, so Friday, I will talk about this. Right? Okay, so let, let's stop here.